All right. All right, let's see if this works. Let's see. Why is that still on? Oh, I know why. There it is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Micro Church of Christ. And we'll be singing uh, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So Oh, 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad the rain didn't keep you home. Because sugar, sugar melts when the water hit it. But anyway, it's a blessing to be here. Amen. You know? Uh, I don't find no better place to be, whether it's rain, snowing, sleeting, or whatever it is. There's no better place to be than the house of the Lord. Amen. It's a privilege to be here. But uh, I'd like to know one thing, did you? Everybody just look at me and go. Well, I did too, and I did it for you, so if you didn't do it, I did it. But God loves us all, you know? And like the song said, what a privilege for him to just care about us like he do. I wanted to say something this morning, but I, I was sitting back there this morning, and I sit on my sit down too long. <coughs> And uh, it didn't, it, I kind of drifted away from me. I thought, oh, you got to give me a break. I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> you know? Uh, I was looking at Mike when he was up here, and he was trying to get everything together here. And we was talking this morning back there, and, he, and I said, why are you squinting your eyes in like this? He said, because I don't have my glasses on. I think he forgot to put his glasses on when he was pressing a little button to try to get what's going on up here. Because <laughs> you notice when he found his glasses, he found out, you know, what was going on. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we don't want to wear our glasses because it makes us look old. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, it don't make any difference. If you're old, you're old. Yeah. You know? So glasses or not. Anyway, I'm just praying that we all come here this morning to receive the word that is going to be brought to us this morning. And uh, just keep praying and keep doing the things that you do and pray for all of us. Don't just pray for yourself. Amen. Pray for everybody else too. You know, because God loves us all, and uh, He wants us all to come together in assembly like we are assembled here this morning, and to love one another. Amen. So shall we go to God in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this this day, Lord. Thank you for the blessing that you bestow upon us every day in our lives. We love you, Lord, and we know that you love us. And we want to be more obedient to you each day, Lord, but sometimes we fall by the wayside. But just, just continue to be patient with us, Lord. We'll come around your way of thinking, and we'll come around your way of doing things. And I know that the way you want us to be, that's the way we're going to be. Sometimes we fight the way that you try to teach us to do, and we fail in every effort. Because you are stronger than us and everybody in all the world, Lord. And just continue to be there for us. And continue to just touch us and bless us. Because we are worth saving, Lord. Sometimes I know that it gets to the point where we don't look like we are worthy. But we are. Like I said, we're just hard-headed and just need, need a little push. Push us back on the path of righteousness. May we continue in your word. Continue to read. And continue to get understanding and not rely on our own understanding. Bless this day, Lord. Bless this assembly. And bless the words that have been brought to us this day, Lord, that my brother Mike so diligently studied for, to bring it to us. May they open up our hearts and minds and get us to see the things you want us to see with your blessing. Bless us to and through this morning as we hear and we go home. Give us your blessing. And may we have safe passage back to our destination. Until the next time. A plenty of time that we assemble together. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> this before the Lord's Supper. By Christ we Yeah. 
the part of the service where we remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we partake of the bread and the, the fruit of the vine. It began back, going back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they did the first sin, that God being God knew that he had to have a plan of salvation. And he knew that it wasn't, he couldn't just accomplish this by the blood of bulls and goats. He knew that he would have to send his son to earth and to have him as a sacrifice and to die on the cross for our sins. He fulfilled all scripture. He came into the world. He was born of a virgin. He would later, when he was around 12 years old, he would go to the temple and the, the teachers would be astonished at his questions and the things that he was saying. I know that when I was 12, teachers were also astonished at my behavior. <laughs> but that was in a much different way. But as he got older, the last three years of his life, he, he uh, did his preaching and he went to the cross and he died for our sins. So as we partake of the bread, would you bow with me? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you went to the cross and, and you, you sacrificed yourself for our sins. That, and be with us now as we partake of this bread, as we remember these events. In your son's name, amen. Amen. You bow with me as we pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Father in heaven, we're, we're so thankful you sent your son to earth and to live that perfect life and to go to the cross and shed his blood for our sins. Be with us now as we partake. In Christ's name, amen. amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Apart from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to give back as we've been prop prospered. That's that, uh, that's that you bow with me now as we play, pray for our many blessings. Dear Father in heaven, we're, we're so blessed to be here this morning to serve you and sing praises to you. We're thankful for Mike for preparing the material. We're, we're so thankful that you send your son to earth to die for our sins. We ask now as we, we give back that you, you bless our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will live for Jesus in the song and we will try to it, sing it a little faster. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding a kingdom, glad heart and free. This
Good morning, everyone. Let us stand for scripture reading and a prayer, please. Scripture reading from Leviticus 11, 44 through 47, and it reads this. For I am the Lord your God, concentrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any, with swarming, with any, <clears throat> with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am the Lord God who brought you out from the land of Egypt to your out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus, <clears throat> you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is a law regarding, regarding the animals and the birds and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth. To make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the edible creatures and the creatures which is not to be eaten. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your manservant, Michael. As he comes forward to share another portion of your word, Heavenly Father, we ask that you help him remember the things that he prepared. Help our hearts and minds to be open and receptive to your word. Not only receptive, but apply to our daily walk, Heavenly Father, that we can share your word with those that we come in contact with. These are our prayers in in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. your children to go to we worship now's the time to take them i see brother brother sandy going back there it's good to see you if you have a bible you might open up to the book of leviticus because i didn't put all the passages on the overhead because there were just too many because we're going to be covering a section and we're going to be talking today about the holy heart of jesus and we're going to be looking at leviticus chapter 11 we're going to look at the first part of that down to chapter 22. And as we do that, we want to understand a couple of things, and that is that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the purpose for the law was to bring people to Christ. Now remember the word Christ means Messiah. You might think, well, how could the people in the Old Testament be brought to Jesus when they didn't really know about Jesus? Well, they knew about the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah. They, they were promised a Messiah that was going to come. And the Messiah was supposed to set up his kingdom, and it was supposed to be a wonderful kingdom. And you and I, if we are in God's church, if you've been baptized in Jesus, we are part of it. And we are part of the kingdom of God. But remember that the Old Testament law, as, we, as we've been looking at, had only shadows and types of what was to come. It didn't have the very substance. So as we look at these things, remember that we're looking at the shadows and types. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, it says, Therefore the law has been our, school, our, has been our tutor or schoolmaster to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The purpose for the law, even in the Old Testament, was to bring people to faith in Jesus. But as we think about that and we look at that, there's some really interesting and rather strange teachings that are in there as we look at those, especially when you look at the idea of the laws of what I call consumption. And you look at the laws of consumption, and you and I, you might think, what's consumption? It means eating. It means consuming things, things that you can eat. You kind of scratch your head. Now, here's what I want you to understand. God had a group of people that he called. He called them in order to bring about the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promised king of David. And so there had to be a physical lineage of people to survive as long as God needed in order for them to come and bring about the one seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, so that that seed could be the Messiah. And so as we read these, I want you to understand two things. There is a sense in which some of these are written for the purpose of health in order to keep them from, for example, uh, being infected with a plague or something. Because God needed these physical people around in order to bring about a physical body that was physically attached to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to David. And so some of these rules were given for that reason, but there's more than that as we look at them. And I want us to understand the more than that as we read these things, because you and I don't worry too much about what we eat unless we start gaining a little weight. In which case, your wife cuts you off from Dr. Pepper. But... As we look at these, what I want us to think about and what I want us to understand is there's more in here than just simply the physical laws and the physical uh, uh, lessons for health. And so the first thing that he tells us in, in, in Leviticus 11 and 1 through 44, like I said, I'm not going to read the whole chapter because they're long. Uh, but if you read those before, you, you, you kind of understand some of these things. He's going to talk about what we call clean and unclean animals or 
things that you can and cannot consume. And to understand that properly, I think we need to go back to the book of Genesis and the very first chapter in Genesis because we need to understand the difference between what happened in, in the Garden of Eden and what happened after the Garden of Eden in order to maybe understand these things a little better than just be healthy. In, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, after God created everything, God said this in verse 29, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God said in the very beginning, nobody ate meat. Everybody, every single creature, everything God made, ate plants. That means the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they ate plants. I want us to understand that. I think if you fail to understand that, then this that he's telling us doesn't make as much spiritual sense as maybe it should. But in the very beginning, that's the way it was. When sin entered into the world, it changed things in our physical world. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, he says, For the creation, this creation, was subjected to futility. Before, in the Garden of Eden, you never died. Nobody died, apparently, in the Garden of Eden. But all of a sudden, when man sinned, then all of a sudden, this world changed. And he says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now we live in a corrupted world. Things die. We get old. Our brand new cars get rusted. Our houses get dry rot. We need to paint them. And our bodies... Well, you know what happens to our bodies, don't you? We live in a corrupted world. And if you don't understand that as we get into this, you're not going to get the spiritual implications that I believe we need to get as we, do, as we look at the kinds of foods that he says that they are to eat and not eat. And the first category of food that he talks about is what I would call for you land animals. Those animals that walk on the land. And there's all kinds. There's, there's thousands of different kinds of species in the world uh, that people today consume. But back then, God said there was a certain boundary that they were supposed to hold to when they ate. And we call this today kosher food, sometimes we call it. In Leviticus chapter 11, in verse 2, it says, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever divides the ho a hoof, thus making split hoofs and choose the cud among the animals that you may eat. Now, if you understand that, if you understand this, ca this category of animals, you had to have, a, I'll just use a cow. A cow, if you notice that a cow's hoof is divided into two parts, right? It's divided into two parts. And the cow chews a cud. Now, if you're not sure what that means is, uh, cows eat grass. And most of the animals that have cuds chew grass. Remember what happened when corruption entered the world? They began to eat meat, right? God says, no, 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 no. You guys don't eat any of those. Don't eat any of those. You're going to only eat the animals that eat grass. And so because they eat grass, sometimes they have two stomachs, sometimes more. And they have this whole thing inside of them that they regurgitate. And they, they take this thing. That's why when you always see a cow, he's always chewing something. We call it ruminating. He's, he's, reg he's regurgitating his food and he's eating it. and he's, he's chewing it over and over so that he can digest it. So God says to these individuals, He says the kind of animals that you're going to eat are number one, that are land animals, number one, they don't eat anything dead. Number two, they have to have a divided hoof. So they might have a cud, but if they don't have a divided hoof, you can't eat them. They might have a divided hoof, but if they don't have a cud, you can't eat them. And you think, why? And I'd suggest to you it's more than just keeping them healthy. There are pictures that God is trying to get them to understand as He is trying to teach them to learn 
what it is that you should put inside of you. Now, God had a people that he had to keep alive right back then. The Messiah already came. It doesn't matter whether my body keeps alive or not in order for God to accomplish his task, except for me personally. But back then it did. And as God is writing this to them, he's telling them what it is that the kind of animal that he wants them to, 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 to uh, ingest or to put inside of them. And that is, he said, it has to have a divided hoof. Now, do you remember when, when God cursed the world? What did he tell the serpent? How did he curse the serpent? You're going to crawl on your belly and you're going to eat dust. His, Satan's heart is going to be right next to the dirt on the earth. God said, we don't eat animals like that. He's telling Israel. You don't eat animals that crawl in the dirt. You eat animals that have legs where your heart is above the dirt and you're standing on legs that have two hooves. I go, why two hooves? Because when we live in this world, we have a divided existence. And if you don't see the divided existence, then you're never going to ingest properly what you need to ingest. Jesus put it like this in John 15 and verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You see, when we are God's people, we live in a divided world. We live in this physical world, don't we? How, how many of you have to cook when you get home? Good, I'm going to your house. Okay. You have to cook when you get home. Well, why? Because you have this physical body that you have to take care of while you're here. But how many of you today came to church while well, you're here? Why? Why, do you, why are you here? Because you have a spiritual reference. Because we're more than just what happens in the dirt. So we have a divided life. Our life is divided. And God says the only animals you can consume are animals that have attached to this world, this divided nature, this divided understanding that we are more than just animals down here in this world. The problem with evolution is they teach you to stand on one hoof. They say you're nothing but flesh, you're nothing but chance, you got here just by accident, and therefore there's nothing more you should look at. You shouldn't look above the sky, because there's nothing up there, except other planets that we're going to go and mess up. <laughs> Jesus says in John 17 and verse 15, I do not ask, he's talking to the Father, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. So as we live in this world, we have to have this understanding that we are these dual-natured people that have one foot in the world and our other foot's supposed to be up there. Our heart is up there. Our heart doesn't drag on the ground like, like Satan did. And that's why he's cursed. And that's why God's stuck him next to the ground because that's where his heart is. By the way, you can't eat pigs because they like to wallow in the dirt. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. We live in this world and sometimes we get attached to this world. God says, but if you're His people, you need to be careful what you're going to ingest. Because He says all that's in the world is if anyone, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in Him. There's those two parts, right? The world and the love of the Father. Which one are you going to do? If you're going to love the world, if you're going to be dragging around on the ground, you're going to put your heart down there. He says then you're going to be concerned with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the boastful pride of life. He says that's not from God. Right. He says the world is passing away. That's why we need to have that cloven hoof. So that we're just not attached to this world down here because this world is going to die. We want more than just living for a little while and dying. At least I do. And I want to serve my God more than just here. You see, the world is passing away and also it's less. But the one who does the will of God, he lives forever. So therefore, Israel, when you eat, when you put something inside of you, you consume only those things that represent an understanding that you have a dual nature attached to this world. And your heart is not to be anywhere close to dragging on the earth. But what about the cod? 
I told you, we often call them ruminating. They take it and they regurgitate it. And that's where we get our word ruminate. It's an old word. We don't use it much anymore. Ruminate actually means to think about stuff. And bring it up and think about it. To consider it. To keep thinking about it. That's what they do with their food. They regurgitate it. They chew it up again. They digest it. And it goes into the other stomach. Then they regurgitate it. And they chew it. And it goes back into the other stomach. And if they don't do that, they die. And God says there are certain things we're supposed to think about. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is anything, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. What are we supposed to be thinking about? Good things. He says... The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And Paul is an apostle telling you what God says in the spiritual world. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You have to think. If you're a Christian and you don't think, you're in trouble. If you don't think about what you watch on television, if you don't think about what you read in novels, if you don't think about how you respond to people or what you say to people, we're not going to have peace. And you look at our media today, and they don't care. They want to create nothing but division and problems. They want you guys to hate one another because of the color of your skin, or because one has more money than the other person, or because one's from a different country, or one's taller, or one's skinnier, or one's beautiful, and one's fat. And you can put, your category, you can put yourself in any one of those categories you want. But we think... God says, if you're going to put something in your mouth, you put something in your mouth that thinks, that causes you to think about what you're doing. And by the way, when I say put it in your mouth, I'm not talking about your mouth, am I? Yeah. I'm talking about up here. Because right. that's, where, that's where your life is. Your life is in what you think and, in what, and what you read, what you, what you let go into your, into your eyes and into your ears and into your hand, and, and what you do with your hands. It's what you consume. And we are always consuming. Some people go to church for the purpose of consuming entertainment. They think that's what church is about. It's supposed to make me feel good. No, sometimes church doesn't make you feel good. Sometimes church makes you feel bad. Because if it's real church, then they're going to tell you what you might be doing wrong. And if you care about God, it's going to affect you. God, church isn't for the purpose of entertaining us. Church is for the purpose of worshiping Him and serving Him and for us to fear Him. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, He says, But examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So not only do you have to live in this world understanding that you are a two-natured person, you have this physical body that you, that you do have to do stuff in this world, but it has a spiritual uh, uh, connection with God where we're going to live with Him, and then you need to think about that. Which is the reason why the elders here always want you to do what? Put your nose in the book. You read all the novels you want and they won't do you any good. You watch all the news media and all the news cast you want, it's not going to do you any good. The only thing that's going to do you any good if you are a person who's standing on this world with a hoof, with a divided understanding of what's going on, the only thing that's going to help you is the Word of God. That's why I appreciate those of you who not only come to worship service, but you also come to Bible class. Because you're willing to learn something. Now some of you know more than I do, so you don't have to come. But those of you that come, you come because you want to learn. Because you want to ruminate. Right. Because sometimes some people think of stuff and you go, hey, you know what, I never thought of that. I never looked at it like that. How do they understand that? And so he's not just talking about health, but he's telling them what it is that you ingest and what it is that you consume. Mm -hmm. But if you're physical minded, then all that matters to you is, am I eating pork today or not? And there was other consumable animals. 
There was other creatures that weren't land animals. They were air animals and they were sea animals. And and God told them what to do. And I would suggest to you that in all of these animals that he lists for them, there's one common denominator that's in all of these things that they're allowed to eat. Whether they're birds or whether they're fish or whether anything in, in the ocean. And that is they don't live off of dead things. They're not allowed to eat vultures. Because vultures do what? Eat dead things. They're only allowed to eat animals, whether fish or birds of the sky, that like would eat grain or, or, or seeds or life, other little live fish or those kind of things. They're not allowed to eat lobsters. They're not allowed to eat crab. Oh, really? That hurt. <laughs> you know why you can't eat lobster and crab? Because they eat stuff dead on the ground. And so God wants them to understand that the only way you're going to live, and the only way man lives, unlike what evolution teaches you, is through something that lived before. Something that was alive before. That's why even Job's friends, who weren't always right, were right when they said this in Job 33 and verse 4. He says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. We have never been able to take something dead and make it alive. Frankenstein movies are only that, movies. (laughs) We've never been able to do it. Now, we have been able to take things that are alive and manipulate those things, but we've never been able to take something that isn't alive and make it alive. I don't care what they tell you in school. We've never been able to do it. Because Jesus says in John 6 and verse 33, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. (sighs) Thanks, God. Because of you, we live. Because of you, our world rotates and spins and you and I don't get thrown off. Because of God, we breathe and we have air. Because of God, we have all these things. Not... Because you don't drive a SUV and pollute the world. Though you should be careful with what you do locally. God's the one who takes care of us. God's the one who gives us life. Life does not come from us. Life comes from God. That's where life comes from. And so God told him, when you consume something else that's not land-based, you have to make sure it's not living off of dead things. Because you don't live off of dead things if you're my people. You never, got, you never came alive by some other means other than God who has always been and always will be alive. Because we don't live by following the dead. You know, that's part of what that was about in, John, in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus had people asking him about being his disciple. You know, one guy said, hey, hey uh, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want. Jesus says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but I don't have any place to lay my head. You sure you want to follow me? Another guy came up to him and said, and said, Lord, permit me first to go bury my father. And I believe when he said that, he wasn't just saying, my dad just now died and I have to go bury him. Because I doubt very seriously if his dad had just now died, he'd be over there listening to Jesus. I believe what he was saying was, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I'm almost ready to inherit my father's money. He's going to die anytime soon, so let me go be there with him when he dies. Then I will get the inheritance as his son, and then I'll come and follow you, because then all my needs will be taken care of by this dead guy. And Jesus says to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. You and I don't live by doing dead things. You and I don't live by following dead things. You and I live in Jesus by following Him who gives eternal life and who has eternal life. We live by following Him. He's the one who does it. And that's why He listed those things, those animals. It wasn't just to keep them physically healthy. Because God, though He was concerned about their physical well-being, was especially concerned about their spiritual well-being. Because you can take care of your physical body all you want. 
And if you're only standing on one hoof, you might look good, but you're dead. And so why did he give them those laws? Well, it says in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 45 through 47, For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now here's what I want to ask you. So up in heaven, God doesn't eat pork? Up in heaven, God doesn't eat lobster? No. Well, then there's something more going on here than just what you eat. He says, this is going to help you understand how to be holy. It's going to help you understand how to be different from the world. It's going to help you understand how to be like me. And he says, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the law regarding the animals and the birds and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between uh, edible creatures and creatures which are not to be eaten. God said, this is going to help you understand what you consume. That's why when we become Christians... <clears throat> We have to repent. And you might say, oh, there's that religious word. No, it's not. It's, it, the word repent just means you change. It means you change your mind. It means that you decide not to do what you used to do before. You know, it's kind of funny. Sometimes you'll baptize so many people. Well, did you repent? Did you repent? You can't tell if they repent. Even if they say they repented, you can't tell if they repent. No. The only way you can tell if they repent is how? by their actions and what, they're, what they have given up that they used to do that they don't do anymore. Right. We need to learn the distinction between what is clean and what is unclean. Because though we live in this world, we have a divided hoof and our heart wants to serve God and isn't close to the ground. And we need to serve Him. And we don't live off of dead things. Amen. Because sin leads to death. You have to think about that. You have to think about that. Two young people in the back of a car, they're not thinking about sin leading to death. They're thinking about fulfilling their lustful desires. They're simply living in this world and thinking that all that matters is how they gratify their flesh. And as long as you're willing to gratify your flesh with me and I'm willing to gratify mine with you, with you it's okay. And God says, no, you have to think. The question is, is it okay with God? It might be okay with a hoof that's on the ground, but it's not okay with a heart that's in the air. And that's why James chapter 1 says, Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it kills you. It kills us. That young couple in the back seat of the car might think it was the best day of their life, and God says they died. They died that day. Because they were only thinking about the hoof on the ground. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, he says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the ones to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? Chew the cud! Think about it. Ruminate over it. Consider it. What are you doing with your life? How do you treat your husband? How do you treat your wife? How do you treat alcohol? How do you treat your employee? What do you eat, even? It's kind of interesting. We say, God, bless this food as I put a pound of sugar in my mouth. <laughs> I've done it. Don't want you to think I haven't done it. But we have to think, don't we? We have to think. That's why he gave him the laws. 
about what they could and couldn't eat. And what was Jesus teaching on them? Was Jesus teaching on consumption? Yes, you have to be careful with what you physically eat. Now that he's here, now that the body that was supposed to come through the line of David is here, what does he say about eating stuff now? Well, you remember he had that problem with the Jewish leaders that came up to him when his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. Right. And, the, and, the, and the teacher said, oh, they're contaminating themselves. Because they're not washing their hands before they eat. By the way, he's not talking germs. He's talking holy contamination. And so Jesus says to them, you guys are nuts. Well, paraphrase. Mark 7, verse 18. And he said to them, to his disciples, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him? Whatever you eat doesn't defile you. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't affect your body. But it doesn't defile you. If my wife decides she doesn't like me anymore and she gives me some special tea and I drink it, I might die. But it hadn't defiled me. He says, you don't want to know what defiles you? It's not not eating pork. It's not whether you eat lobster or not. That's not what defiles you. What defiles you, he says, verse 19, he says, because it does not go into the heart, but into the stomach is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the mouth, that is what defiles a man. You know why? Because if mean judgmental, rude, vicious, malicious words come out of your mouth, that's what's in your heart. And that's what defiles a man. So the New Testament doesn't teach us, you and I have to worry about the actual physical food that we consume, other than we understand that God's using our body as we serve Him, and so we need to be careful as, you know, as much as we can. But God wants us more concerned about what we put into our mind. And then he had the laws of secretion and discharge. And those are rather weird laws. If you ever read Leviticus, you read it and you go, what in the world is all this about? And you read it. And so I'm persuaded that a number of, of Christians don't read it because they read it. They go, I don't know what this has to do with it. It doesn't have to do with me. The laws are schoolmaster right. to lead us to Christ. The laws of, dis, of decretion are found, uh, or discharge and secretion are found in Leviticus 12 through 15. But let's start off with understanding the principle. You have to go to Genesis chapter 3. And when you go to Genesis chapter 3, you remember Adam and Eve sinned and God is cursing them, right? Remember that? And God curses the devil first, and so or Satan first, and I have him here just to show you that what I told you about him crawling on the ground is the curse of God. Verse 14 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. you got to have your heart above the ground. Verse 19. Talking to Adam, he says, towards the end of his curse, By the sweat of your, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Before they sinned, he was not going to return to dust. After they sinned, he was going to return to corruption. And a picture of sin is anything associated with death, rottenness, decay because all of that results from sin. So if you have an oozing pus pocket, you wouldn't have had that in the garden. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, God doesn't give us death. God gives us life. He says, who alone, has, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God's giving us life. 
Not death. In John 6, and verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. And so anything that's oozing or running or is a discharge is related to sin and evil. It's, rela it's related to the result of sin. And sin is usually always contagious. That's the way it starts, isn't it? You see one person do it and you go, hmm, like Adam did. Really? It tastes good? And you didn't die? Okay. And it's contagious. So you have this rather weird discharge during birth. And I don't know if you read it, but if you read it in verses Leviticus 12, 1 through 8, I'm not going to read it to you. Like I said, I don't have time. We'd be here all day. But basically what he says is there's three different kinds of discharge. There's, there's if, if, a, if a woman has a baby, she's going to, whether it's male or female, for seven days she's going to be unclean because that's the usual period for a, a, a lady on her menstrual cycle. God says they're unclean for seven days. If you have a boy... You're additionally unclean for 33 days. If you have a girl, you're additionally unclean for 66 days. And you might go, why? You know, I don't know about you, but that's what I do all the time. I, I, I read the Word of God and I go, why? Why this? Why that? Why baptism? Why? And then God sometimes opens my eyes and sometimes he leaves them shut. Well, let me make some suggestions for you as we think about this. I think we need to understand the picture. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man, that's both, both of them, in our image. So men and women are made in the image of God, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made, uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So as we read this, I don't want you to think, well, God didn't create women and God did, or, or created men. No, God said he created both of them, but it's the manner in which he does it that I want to look at for just a minute because in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man... That's a male. From the dust, from the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. God directly created man from the dirt. What does number three stand for? God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How many days was Jesus in the grave? How many hours was it dark when Jesus was on the cross? Three represents... God. When a male child is born and the secretion happens after the regular normal period, she's unclean for 33 days. Because God created the man. Well, what about the woman? Well, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept... And he, this God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Where did the woman come from? Came from God, but through the man. And what day was man created on? On the sixth day. Six represents man. If you have a girl baby, how long God consider you unclean? 66 days. Because she was taken from the man. Now, the point I'm making, I just want you to understand where that came from, where I think it came from. Okay, But what I want you to understand is the reason for this, the reason for the decretion. God says... Whether you have a man or whether you have a, a, a girl, they sinned. They both sinned. Whether God brought the man into the world through his own efforts or whether he brought 
the, the woman into the world through the, through the rib of man, they sinned. And the, decree, the secretion represents that decay for them. Isn't it interesting that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. When you have a son, unless he dies before age, you can be guaranteed of one thing. What? He will sin. If you have a girl, unless she dies before of age, what will you know? She will sin. And God says, I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that whatever comes from the world and whatever comes from man dies. And to remind you of that, I'm going to give you this law. <clears throat> and then he lists the law of leprosy. And it's a long section, chapter 13 and 14. In chapter 13, he describes how it is that you get it, and he identifies it, and he talks about oozing stuff and sores and marks, and you know whether it's on me or whether it's on the house or whether it's on clothes, uh, it's considered leprosy. Now, here's a couple of things I want you to understand as we consider this idea of leprosy for just a minute. Like I said, I can't read all the scriptures, but in Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 45, here's the outcome of leprosy. Here's what it says. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn. And the hair of his head shall be uncovered. And he shall cover his mustache and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And certainly God is indicating that he doesn't want infection to spread, but there's more to it than that. Because he's talking about the utter and complete corruption of leprosy. And what's interesting is, is that when you look at the Bible and you look at leprosy and where leprosy came from, it generally came from somebody who wasn't obedient to God initially. In Numbers chapter 12 and verse 10, you have the story about when Miriam and Aaron were opposing Moses because they thought Moses was getting up at him. And taking the lead. And they said, we, we can take the lead too. Right. And God came down and said, no, you can't. And when he left, it says this in verse 10. But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the, the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned towards Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Leprosy represented sin. Represented sin. Do you remember the king... King Uzziah, who thought he was doing really well and he thought he was so smart and so faithful that he could offer stuff to God. It says this in Second Chronicles 26 and verse 19, But Uzzah, with the censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priest, because the priest said, You're not allowed to do that. The leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the, in the house of the Lord. You know why it was on his forehead? Because he wasn't thinking. He says, beside the altar of incense. And uh, Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him. And behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they, hur and they hurried him out of there. And he, and he himself also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. Leprosy represents sin. Mm -hmm. And you're never any good to anybody mm -hmm. as long as you're in sin. There's some that are pretty obvious about that. If you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, you're not any good to anybody. Mm -hmm. There's others that aren't so obvious. You're just a lustful guy. Mm. And like changing new wives every time you don't like the one you got. Yeah. It's not as obvious. But it's going to affect society. And it has. In some cultures more than others. And then in chapter 14, he told you how to cleanse the leprosy. And there's this whole big long section about it, about 
taking two birds and a piece of wood and some scarlet thread and tying them together and getting a bowl and washing it and cutting one and letting one free and all sorts of stuff. And then, and then, there, and, and then after that happens, the guy has to take a lamb and slaughter it and save all his hair off and save all his skin off and sit outside his house for seven days. And you're like, seriously? And I ask, why? Because God wants us to understand that the curing of leprosy requires an act of God. Remember Naaman the leper? Second Kings chapter 5 verse 1 it says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of, uh, of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord... Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, you understand what that means, has given victory to Aram. And the man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in a band and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. This little girl, she says, there's only one way you can get rid of leprosy. And there's a prophet in Samaria. His name was Elijah. And he can heal you of the leprosy, but you have to go to him. And you remember the rest of the story if you don't read it on your own. I don't have time to tell you. And in Matthew chapter 8, as Jesus was walking around, it says in verse 2, and the leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus said, I gave a procedure. God gave a procedure a thousand years ago on what you're supposed to do when a leper is cleansed. And the priests who were priests had to learn that even though they probably never used it in their entire life. They had to learn how it was to be done and how a leper was supposed to be cleansed. They had to know what to do with the two birds and the bowl of water and the scarlet, and the scarlet string. They had to know what to do with it. They had to know what to do with the lamb that was brought uh, after the seven days. They had to know all of that stuff. And Jesus says to this leper, I know you're cleansed, but you need to go be a testimony. By this testimony, the people in Jesus' day are going to know that Jesus is God. He's God. And that suggests to you that when you look at the manner in which they're cleansed. It's a picture of what I would call for you spiritual recovery. The man was to take the two birds. He was to take it down to the priests. The priests were to take it with a little plank of cedar wood and a scarlet thread. And they were to take one bird and they would slap it on there after they wring its neck and cut it. And they would put it on that board and they would tie it with a scarlet Mm -hmm. See, Jesus died on a plank of wood. Mm. And Jesus was a bird because he's from heaven because that's where birds live. And the scarlet thread represents his blood. And they took that and they would pour the water over that and run it into that little bowl. And then they would take that bowl and they would take some of it and they would sprinkle it on the guy who was clean. And then they would take the other bird and they'd let it fly. Mm -hmm. Because until we come to Jesus, we can't fly Amen. into the heavens. And he was to take seven days later a lamb, and he was to slay it, and he was to shave from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot every piece of hair off his head. He was supposed to go now into the community where he lived, go to his house, put a, put a bench outside his house, and sit there for seven days bald. I mean, he's dressed, but he's bald and no hair. And you know when you come by and you see your neighbor and he's bald and no hair in a culture where everybody has a beard right. and everybody has hair, right. what are you going to do? What in the world happened to you? 
he's going to say, this man named Jesus healed my leprosy. Mm -hmm. And if they're ruminating, Mm -hmm. if they understand that there's one foot on the ground and one foot in heaven, they're going to understand that the only person who can cure leprosy is God. And some of us are full of leprosy. Some of us were drunks. Some of us were drug abusers. Some of some of us loved pornography. Some of us loved taking advantage of people. Some of us loved using fear and intimidation to get people to do what we wanted to do. We were full of leprosy. And we weren't any good to anybody except the devil. Until Jesus came along. And he says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 1, And therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, because they didn't like what he was doing, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. People who are willing to do what God says, even when the world makes fun of them, have decided no longer to live in sin. He says, So as to live the rest of the times and the life no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And now you're sitting out there as a Christian. And they say, let's go to the bar and get drunk and see who can hold the most liquor. And you used to say, okay. But now you sit outside your house and go, I won't go. You might say, let's go clubbing and find some women that we can sleep with like we used to do. And if you're God's people and He's cleansed, you're going to sit outside your house and you're going to go, I won't go. And you will be a testimony Amen. to Jesus. Amen. And so we're to avoid the deadly discharges of men. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 22 says, Stop regarding man who, who's the, whose breath of life is in his nostrils. For why should, you, why should you esteem him? Why in the world do we listen to people, whether they're movie stars or whether they're scientists, who tell us they know how the world got here? Or we know what you can and can't do with how you dress. We don't watch the Oscars, but my wife is flipping through the channel. We happen to catch a glimpse of a lady that was on the runway and one leg was sticking out and half her chest was showing and my wife looked at me and says, why do they do that? I said, because that's the way the world is. And that's what they're trying to show our women what it means to be fashionable. And we look to them and we decide to be dressed like them and we want to wear their named clothes and we want to be like them so we can identify with them and people can know the kind of purse that we have and the kind of clothes that we wear. And I wonder, do we really ruminate about that? So what does man do? Well, man says there's no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. He says, a psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. They promise lies or they promote lies. First, in Romans 1, in verse 18 and 19, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God has made it evident to them. They lie. They lie. Even religious lies. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, he says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience with a branding iron, men forbidding to marry and advocating abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. And there's people who tell you they're doing things religiously that God never said. And they practice evil. 
In Colossians 2 and verse 18, he says, For let no one defraud you of your pride by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking a stand on visions he has, not, uh, he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being f- supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elemental principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Which some people have the idea, if you don't do those things, that's what's going to get you to heaven. Which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they're no value against fleshly, fleshly indulgences. Why would you want to follow anything that comes and is secreted out of man? And that has to be atoned for Chapter 15 talks about men being cleansed in 13 through 15 and women being cleansed in 15 through 28. And how do they do it? Well, they're supposed to bring two turtle doves in some cases. Remember what, where doves come from, right? Genesis 1 and verse 21. God created great sea monsters and every living creature that moves which, uh, with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind and God saw that it was good. Where do the birds fly? In the heavens. So you bring a dove for a sacrifice and you always have to ask why? Because a dove represents Jesus in this context and that's why they offer it. The law is designed to be a tutor to bring us to Christ. In John 8 and verse 23, Jesus says, and he was saying to them, you are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Want to be cleansed from your leprosy? Want to be cleansed from the the decretions and the the, um, secretions of men? It requires Jesus. And that's why In the very same section, in the middle of this section, because we're not done with it, in the middle of this section, he has the Day of Atonement mentioned in Leviticus 16, 1 through 34. And you know what the Day of Atonement is? It's the payment for your sins. Because they were supposed to understand it's not really whether they eat that meat or don't eat that meat that makes them right with God. What makes them right with God is what Jesus was going to do for them. And that's why in Leviticus 16, in verse 5, it says... He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And we've talked about all those. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for a sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats and one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot of the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. (coughs) Want to know what all that means? You got to come back next week. John 8, 9 and verse 28 simply says this about Jesus. So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. We hope you come back next week to finish the holy heart of Jesus. God's people are to be holy. And the only way to be a peculiar people is by being different from the world and having Jesus' heart will make us different. We are all unclean and we're dead in our sins. Jesus makes us clean when when we accept Him in baptism to be cleansed from sin. Then we are to walk in holiness. 
And by the way, I forgot to mention, Sister Carol was baptized last Sunday, if you didn't know, and so was Natasha. Natasha's not here, uh, but she was also baptized this last week. Uh, and Natasha is uh, married to uh, Kevin, and they're the ones that have like seven children, I think, and she's pregnant. You see every once in a while, uh, but they work, and so it's hard for them to be here. But they were baptized into Jesus, so we're rejoicing with them. We can help, aid or help you in any way. Ask you to come forward. Well, together we stand. I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I Also, before our prayer, we'd like to encourage uh, to check the playlist. Uh, there is a few people over here that most in the half of the people here, we, we don't know them. Uh, I know them, but some of you don't, like especially Dorothy Bill, Minnie Counts, and um, Eula Shelley, Anna Sindel, Barbara is here today, I think. Yeah. Uh, she's here, okay. So I will encourage you all that I when you pray, do it more special and say their names. Sometimes when we come up here to pray for them, it will, <coughs> we have to get a list. But when you're at home, it's a lot easier. And that would be more special pray to, to, to the Lord for that special person. So when I pray today, I will pray for all of this, but I will mention no names. Okay. <laughs> uh, let us pray. Uh, dear Lord in heaven, we thank you. We thank you especially for letting us be here this morning and 
and sing songs to you and praise you. And at this time, Lord, we pray for all the shoutings that are, even they're not here today, but they're still faithful to you because they love you and they want to be with you someday. We pray for those who, the Shariahs and all of those who got up sick, they're sick and they can't be here. We pray, Lord, that you help them in their difficult times and maybe someday they'll be back with us and share their thoughts with us. Uh, also, Lord, we like to pray for those who lost someone. Uh, Troy and uh, Lee Burnett, we pray for their families and we ask the Lord to give them comfort at this time or their loss. It's a lot different for everyone when we lost someone, but we can never, we can never feel like they feel. Lord, we pray that you be with us as we live today and go to our homes, keep us safe, keep us away from evil. And especially, Lord, we'd like to thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. church it might hurt I don't know if anybody else but I got my toe stepped on this morning and sometimes that hurts and I thank you Mike thank you for that uh, those in need of prayer we mentioned Don is having some stomach issues uh, he's lost over 8 pounds in the last week uh, so I want to remember him in our prayers Lee Burnett uh, her son, Jerry Pass, will be having his memorial service this coming Saturday. Uh, remember Troy's family and Nico's grandmother. Uh, good to see you here. Offer our condolences and, and sincere wishes for you. Uh, keep, keep Jerry Frenzel in your prayers also as he's battling cancer. We did learn that the cancer has not metastasized, so it hasn't gone into the lymph nodes. Uh, right now, it's just contained <clears throat> in the in the nodule on his neck. Uh, Jerry's memorial, Lumis Church of Christ, Jerry Burnett's memorial. <clears throat> uh, servants meeting today, elders and preachers. Uh, our two deacons are both out today, so they will not be able to uh, to be with us. Ladies fellowship class today uh, in the book of Esther. And uh, I, I like the book of Esther. Bible reading, we do hope and pray you're still still keeping up with that. Uh, Wednesday study time will meet at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. And then mark your calendars for the first Saturday. Men's breakfast this month will be on April Fool's Day. <laughs> for what that's worth. Uh, <clears throat> third Sunday is, is like today, ladies' fellowship and uh, elders, deacons, preachers meeting. And if I may take two more minutes, I want to want to uh, piggyback on what Mike has was talking about ruminating. And when you ruminate, you think. Is it true? Whether you're talking, telling a story, uh, thinking of doing something that you used to do, is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Do you really need to repeat everything? And the last, of course, is it kind? 
So when you're ruminating, think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If it's not any one of those, you may be crossing that line into either gossip or sin. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Amen.